During our class videos, you may hear our poets and playwrights use terms that are new to you. We have created a list of key terms and definitions that you can refer to at any point during our video lectures. This list is available on the Videos and Readings class page, where you can read it or download it as a PDF. If you would like to find and review these terms while you watch each class video, you can stop this video, go back to the Videos and Readings class page, and download the PDF. There you can play this video in each of the following class videos. If you have any questions about these terms, we encourage you to ask your teaching team in the weekly class discussions. Nina Morrison is an American director and playwright. Her works include Feminal, Forest Maiden, and she has directed Lady from the Sea, Family Dinner, Silo Tree, Thing with Feathers, and Don't Go. She is an MFA candidate at the Iowa Playwrights Workshop. Um, hi, I'm Nina Morrison. I'm a second year playwright at the University of Iowa Playwrights Workshop. Um, I completed the MFA directing program at the University of Iowa in 2016, and now I'm continuing as a playwright. So I'm coming from those two fields in theater. I, um, I'm going to talk to you about the project that I most recently did, uh, a play that I wrote and directed called Aurora Fra Bergen or Ibsanity. I directed the play Lady from the Sea by Ibsen the, the year before for my thesis production, and I was in awe of it, and it drove me crazy. So I needed to write a play about that or do something in homage to it. I didn't have any choice. I, I just the play was consuming me, and so I had to do my own version. So um, so when I refer to my play, I'm going to refer to Ibsanity, the short version of the title. Um, I decided to set it in Oslo, Norway, um, even though Lady from the Sea was set in an unnamed northern, very small town, and... Uh, I wanted to do something that contrasted a, a modern city, but that was far away enough from America and American culture that we felt the difference, um, that we still felt that separateness that you feel when you're watching an Ibsen play because it's from a long time ago and uh, it can be very easily dismissed as not relevant. Um, and I think geographic distance does a little bit of the same thing. Um, so we can look at these issues and say, oh, Norwegians are, Norwegians are crazy. That's why they act this way. And it's, you know, or that was a long time ago. And we don't do that anymore. We don't treat women that way anymore. We don't um, think about social roles or marriage in the same way. And what I wanted to do with my play was to say, okay, it's really far away, but yes. Yes, we do. <laughs> there's there's so much uh, economy and um, capitalism and culture tied up with the role of women and the role of women in marriage. Uh, and my play is about uh, a marriage between two women. And um, so that's not a topic that Ibsen would have taken on. But there was so much overlap that it seemed, it, it, it's, it, it wasn't even distracting, at least to me. I mean, you know, of course I'm in a liberal bubble, but it doesn't matter. You can, the, the, the theme was so strong from Lady from the Sea and from Ibsen's general themes that uh, I, it, it didn't seem like a huge jump. It didn't feel like I was looking at something that had been written um, 120 something years ago, uh, it felt more, it, it felt extremely modern and relevant and, um, and very easily was ad adaptable. Uh, <coughs> choosing to, to set a play in a city that I've never been to was um, challenging, but also really fun because then I could just make it into whatever I wanted. Um, I felt very liberated by that. I'm sure 
Oslo residents would probably be a little annoyed by that, but I, you know, they could do the same thing to Iowa City or New York or whatever. It's fine. Um, I watched a lot of travel videos of um, Oslo residents using selfie sticks to talk about their different neighborhoods, and um, I I felt I had to do that because. Um, my research for Lady from the Sea was so based in geography. It's called Lady from the Sea. Ibsen constantly references the Norwegian landscape, which is almost entirely coastal. And uh, the sea affects daily life so much there that to ignore it would be, um, you would be doing a disservice to his work. Um, and, and I, I wanted to have the same sort of anchor for my play, so I chose Oslo and Norwegian pop culture and m modern Norwegian music. We had some Norwegian rap in there. Uh, just any anything that could ground us in a place that was different than America and infused with a, a different cultural and cultural values um, while still making it possible to comment on um, the play that I was referencing. The stuff that really made me crazy about Lady from the Sea when I was directing it, uh, numerous. So uh, the main thing was that there were massive tonal shifts um, that on first read seemed entirely unjustified. I, I mean, the, the biggest example, the biggest, most obvious example is in the last three pages of the play, a woman, this woman who was married to an older doctor, it's a marriage of convenience, it's a financial arrangement, essentially. Um, they are really married, but it was not a marriage of great passion. Um, she has been pining the entire play for a sailor who she had a very, very passionate affair with uh, and did not tell anyone. And this sailor returns to take her away. She claims that she has a spiritual connection with him. She sees him in dreams. It's, it, it sounds like they had a very wild sex life. It just, he's, he's the opposite of everything that her life is in, in the present, in the play. And um, he shows up, he says, I'm here to take you. And then her husband forbids her first. And then she begs for her freedom because I guess at that time in Norway, and I think most other places, women were considered the property of their husbands. Um, and before that they were the property of their fathers. And so she was the property of him and he could forbid her to go anywhere. Um, so then, uh, in the last three pages of the play, her husband, the old doctor, says, okay, I give you freedom of choice. I grant it to you. You are granted freedom to choose. And then because he grants her this freedom, supposedly, this is the justification for this, because he grants her the freedom, she rejects the old passionate lover and says, I want to be with the guy I'm married to now because... He gave me my freedom. So um, after the whole buildup of this, this other man and then, the, you know, for him to say, okay, you're free. And then suddenly she shifts her entire energy over to him in those last three pages was uh, really difficult. I mean, I found it impossible to, to justify it. Ultimately, um, I did my best, but uh, I'm not entirely sure. I'm, I'm pretty sure I didn't succeed in directing that with any kind of true believability. I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone left the theater thinking, uh, why didn't why didn't she just go with the other guy? <laughs> like she had the freedom to choose, so why wouldn't she go with him? Um, and uh, but then talking through it with the actor who was playing um, the main character, Alita, she we talked a lot about the practicality. Um, what her life would look like if she had gone off with this rogue sailor, what um, what could happen to her? How would she how would she live? 
Would she live on a boat? Uh, would she have to stay for a long time by herself while he was off? Would she work? Would, you know, would she, she would be leaving a very, very comfortable, stable existence um, with someone who really doted on her. So, um, so I kind of found some justification for it there, but uh, I was just, I was so frustrated with her depiction throughout the play of this woman who, she says a lot of things that are strange. She says a lot about how she's called Lady from the Sea because she's obsessed with the sea and she thinks that all people should really live in the sea and that we're basically just, just flawed fish um, and that we should be there. And everyone in the play just goes along with it. And there's an understanding based on just a few lines that men in the play are all obsessed with her and that they go along with and support some of the things that she says because she's so attractive um, and they all have developed a certain obsession for her physically. And, um, and so then when I went to write my play, because I was so consumed by this play, uh, when I went to write my play, I, I really wanted to address um, what is it if you if you're the one making the choice if there's no one there to say i'm going to grant you the freedom to make this choice you know technically women can make their own choices now and so what what is it if you're if you're looking at i'm i'm really set up and i want stability um and then the most passionate love of my life soulmate shows up after they've been gone a long time, what happens if you say no to them? What, what is that if you say no to them? Um, and what is it if you say no to all of that that entails? And so that's, that's what I ended up writing about. And it was, a, it was about a lesbian marriage, but the circumstances were the same. Um, younger woman, very beautiful, lots of people obsessed with her. Um, and then older, extremely wealthy, uh, adoring wife who offered to take care of her. Um, once I decided to write this, I wanted to reference Ibsen in the location and set it in Norway, but I did set it in Oslo. Um, and I really I really used extremely simple signifiers for where we were. Uh, I, I just wrote lines where they would say the name of the bank that they worked at, which is a, an actual Norwegian bank that I just found online. And, uh, and then I had them refer to Oslo a lot and then refer to neighborhoods in Oslo and then um, there's a, the character, the title character, Aurora from Bergen. She's from Bergen, and um, which is known in Norway as a very sleepy university town. And so they talk about her being from Bergen and how different it is in Oslo and um, how boring Bergen is and how great Oslo is. And um, so I just, I tried to do a, a lot of uh, groundwork with, just just embedding the information in the lines. Um, I didn't do much with the stage directions. I used the stage directions more as a clues for the reader as to the tone of the script. So far less information about the actual setting of the play and more information about the tone of the play, that things that were meant to be read as comedic, um, the, the juxtapositions inherent in, in the visuals, you know, um, for instance, there's one character that's extremely flamboyant and we would be in a very sterile conference room setting with the flamboyant character, you know, the stage directions would be like, she writhes on the desk, um, stuff like that. Just, just to give a sense of the inappropriate nature of her activity or the un why it would be particularly inappropriate in that setting. Um, I'm trying to think what else I did for uh, settings. Um, 
I just made the where they were very important to them. It, it also, being in Oslo was a, a high stakes thing for the characters, especially for Aurora, who was from Bergen. And so there was a lot said about how she was from a boring place and how could she be there and that it was meaningful to be in Oslo where there's art and culture and you're more of, of a, a central hub for travel and... Um, and for a more international setting. Uh, the Ibsen is considered the master of the well-made play. The, the, okay, this is going to not be a good, like a great definition of the well-made play, but it's, uh, Someone has a secret. The main character has a secret. Um, the main character has uh, an old friend come into town. Um, so they just show up. And then uh, the old friend either knows a little bit about the secret or is confided in about the secret. So then that piece of information is out there. And then the person involved in the secret, so in Lady from the Sea, it was the, that there had been this passionate affair before. In A Doll's House, it was that Nora had forged the, um, some paperwork illegally to get a loan to save her husband, but um, it was still considered evil. Uh, so, the old friend comes into town, the old friend is confided in, and then um, the person involved in the secret, then they show up. And then, uh, and then the, the, that's the climax of the play, and then it gets resolved. Um, and there's usually a maid. <laughs> um, just kidding, there's not always a maid. <laughs> um, so, I thought, I thought it was so funny how the, there's always that structure present in Ibsen plays and in, in well-made plays, and um, and then after directing it, and then starting to write one with that be, that started to become a well-made play, I realized the extreme power in that formula. I mean, maybe it's a formula and maybe it's corny and it's really easy, easily identified, but it doesn't matter. It, it really works. I, I was really pulled through the narrative of the play of Lady from the Sea and all of Ibsen's plays um, by that structure. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter <laughs> that it's a formula and that it's corny. It, it's extremely useful. And, um, and I found that, I mean, because I'd been living with it for so long, but I, I really found that when I sat down to write, I couldn't write anything else. It had to be that. And, um, which was startling, uh, when I started working on it. And, uh, and then I just decided to go with it because why fight it? You know, it's obviously a really powerful form. Um, and so I wasn't adapting Ibsen ever. I, I don't, I'm pretty sure I couldn't do that. Um, I don't speak Norwegian. Uh, I've never even been there. I, I would just have a lot of work to do before I could do something like that. But I found that I had no choice but to respond to it after living with that play and working on it for a year, I couldn't write in any other way. And, um, and once I started writing that way, it was extremely satisfying. Um, it was extremely satisfying to have a, a structure. It was, you know, I just kept thinking like, oh, when, when is the old friend going to show up? Or when, wh when are we going to learn this part of the secret? Or, um, when is the person going to show up? And, um, so it, it drove me as a writer as much as it did as a reader um, and as a director. There's, there's something way more powerful about form that I didn't realize until this whole experience. I think my, my final thoughts about setting would be to just accept that 
the setting has stakes for your characters. Even if you're set in a place that is not identifiable. I mean, look at Beckett, you know, uh, that, that setting still has incredibly high stakes for, for the people within the world. Um, so, so just, just accept that that's going to happen, um, that it's virtually impossible to write a play set anywhere or nowhere and not have it affect uh, what, what happens or the, or, or not have it affect the characters at all. It, it just does. And so it's better to just lean in and, um, and savor and fill, fill it, fill it out as much as you possibly can. It really will feed the narrative. 